Welcome into the latest edition of ESPN SC. I'm Dan Thomas, joined in the studio today by Shaka Hisov and Stevie Nicker. We'll start with a story that looks like Darwin Nunez is heading to Liverpool in a massive deal. 80 million euros is the fee, plus reports suggesting 20 million in add-ons. This, of course, young, exciting Uruguayan striker, only 22 years of age. Uh, for more, let's welcome in Luis Garcia. But before we get to the former Liverpool midfielder, Let's start off with Gab Marcotti. Gab, we're close to the finish line, aren't we, on this one? Certainly very, very close. All the indications, not just from, uh, uh, from Lisbon, uh, but from the, the, the entourage of the player, shall we say, uh, as well as uh, a lot of Liverpool-based reporters are ready to confirm this. So I, I think it's just a matter of time um, until, until we get the official, red, uh, the official green light. Um, the biggest hurdle was the agreement with, uh, with Benfica. I think the terms of the player were, were sorted out some days ago. Luis, with your Liverpool ways, how excited are you about this transfer? Actually very excited. I mean, after seeing that how Darwin Nunez was uh, killing it last year uh, in the Champions League and domestic league back in uh, scoring 26 goals in the domestic league in Portugal. I think it's one of the ads that Liverpool has been waiting for. The moment that the Jurgen Klopp uh, play against this Benfica side and Darwin Nunes was one of the more exciting players on the field, was a, a big threat from the, from the left side. Uh, start talking about it. I think the club has been just trying to work on that during the past uh, few months. At the end, it looks like it's going to be a, a done deal in the coming hours. Probably tomorrow, just taking the, the medical uh, test and finally, just probably showing and uh, being one of the next Liverpool uh, players for next season. And what can I say? I'm very excited. He's a fantastic player. Stevie, we were talking before and you're saying this is an element that maybe Liverpool have been missing yeah. over the last few seasons. Explain why. Well, unless, unless it's a piece of brilliance from, from either Armani or Salah and away areas, uh, then it's just lots and lots of passing and little, little one-twos and try to get half a yard in the penalty box. You know, there has never been a threat from a wide area with a ball in the air. You know, we've, we've talked about how great Jota is in the air, but to have a real centre forward with more height and just another option, an option that Liverpool really haven't had. You know, you can just, you can just fling a ball in the box and this guy will find a way of getting on, on the end of it. And, and you and I were, or certainly you were asking me questions about, you know, what's wrong with Liverpool? How come they didn't score a goal in, in these three, three basic cup finals? Mm. Well, clearly, Klopp was thinking the same thing as you'd done. Did you realise how clever you are? Yeah, and straight so, away, yes. right off the you bat... You would call him a smarty pants Real Madrid well, fan. Well, right <laughs> off the bat, he's a, he, he, on the face of it, has addressed that. Here's a guy who I think will be Liverpool's next number nine, and a guy who will score from just a ball thrown in the box, which Liverpool haven't been able to do in the future. So it's an extra weapon, and it's up front. Fantastic. The obvious question is the money in that it is a lot that Liverpool haven't really committed to so much in the past. It may be exciting to see Van Dijk was a big signing, Alisson as well. Well, do you think so? Because they're going to get at least 35 million for money, right? So take that off your 80. The 20 in add-ons are if he does well, are if Liverpool win the Nile Champions League right. or a Premier League, which means they're going to bring more money in anyway. So this is an absolute no-brainer. Right, really? So, so well, they're, they're basically, if they get 35 for Manny, yep. they're basically getting this guy for 45. A 22-year-old who, I would be shocked at any team in the planet that wouldn't want this guy, just because Liverpool have managed to do it. I'll bet you any other team in the planet would want him. So, no, this is a great deal. And can he take that role as a striker and the pressure that goes with it at Liverpool? There is always that question that you, you can't answer until the guy puts the jersey on right. and plays. I could sit here and say, yes, oh yes, he looks great, he looks to have a great attitude, all of these things. But until, it's, until somebody does it, it's ha you can't nail it down. Yeah. What I would say is, though, is at 22 and what he's shown in the Champions League in particular... There's no reason why he can't. Luis, that is a little unknown, as it is to anyone, really, going to a big club like Liverpool and taking the role as a number nine. Whether or not he can live up to that reputation or it gets too much for him. 
Yeah, exactly. Absorb all that pressure, being a number nine at Liverpool, being uh, 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 probably the most uh, expensive player in the history of the club is something that is going to be there. The, every single time that he goes on the field, people is going to be aware of that. And that's something that is very difficult to manage. But I think that is something spe special for uh, you Hawaiian players, these kind of players. And it's true that it depending on for, uh, what, how, what country are you coming from, you adapt better to different uh, uh, situations, to different uh, competitions. And Uruguayans always uh, compete well everywhere they go. It doesn't matter if it's Premier League, La Liga, uh, Liga, uh, Liga. They adapt well. They they got that uh, special character that they, from uh, from the streets. That they they compete well. They are always very aggressive when they are on the field. That's something that he can bring uh, something special for this uh, Liverpool side. So I think that that can help him to adapt quick, to be bold when he's on the field, to put that kind of pressure on the side. But definitely, I'm with uh, uh, Steve uh, here. That is something that we don't know at the moment. We expect that he's going to uh, perform well, that he's going to be a fantastic signer for Liverpool, but until we don't see it in a few months, because I'm not telling you to the first game or maybe the, the, the first few games, we have to give him the chance of, uh, of playing quite a few games, then we'll have to say, yes, that's a fantastic signing and he's worth uh, $100 million. Luis, he starts from day one, yeah? Say again? He starts from day one. He gets straight into the starting eleven. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I think that Jürgen has proven every single time that if you are OK to play, you're going to play. But he's not a manager who is going to give you the chance just because you just cost 100 million. You have to prove it every single training and when you have the, the opportunity to play. And we've seen it with Diogo Jota when he was well and he arrived, he played. With Luis Diaz when he, was, uh, he arrived and he was doing well, he played him. And exactly with everybody here, if you are performing well, if you are giving what he wants uh, on the 11 Saturday, yes, you're going to have the chance. We've seen it with Curtis John, with Harvey Nico, uh, with players, Javier Eli, sorry, players who are young, who are uh, maybe not adapted to this Premier League. But if you, they compete well, you are going to have the chance. But it doesn't matter if you have cost 100 million. You have the opportunity, but you have to grab it. And if you don't play well, if you don't give me that, there are going to be two, three players ready to get that chance. We've talked a lot, haven't we, about Real Madrid just looking to freshen things up with about bringing in youth. And you look at this Liverpool team now, Stevie, and the squad within it, and those that are starting on the periphery of it. it it's very young. You took look at Fabio Carvalho, of course, who signed from Fulham. There's a lot of strength in depth. There's a lot of youth in depth. Are you on board with this going forward or is it dangerous in the fact that you can, might have a situation like Arsenal, for example, where you need more maturity well, on got, the pitch? You've, you've got eight names down there, right? Yep. And I'm looking at those eight names and there's only two at the bottom, Harvey Elliott and Fabio Cavallo are coming in, who are not streetwise, worldwise international wise you name it look at it y yes 23 23 25 is the oldest yeah but you see the experience they've got these guys have, these guys have played multiple champions league finals yeah and they're only 25 the oldest one so absolutely not it's it's called planning dan uh, and we shouldn't forget that and we should should give a lot of credit to fsg for what they've done at the club right up until now yes huge difference getting klopp and the way he coaches his players and the way he, he brings his players along. But the planning behind it has been absolutely sensational. And you only need to look down the, down the road at Manchester to see what happens when you don't really have a plan. So this thing is going in the right direction and it's going like an express train right now. Well, what's interesting, Shaq, is keeping everyone happy yes. then, isn't it? That's kind of a, a new element to it because Liverpool had a very defined first team, which has kind of changed over the last couple of seasons. But if you're someone like Carvalho coming in from Fulham, of course, where you've been so good in mm -hmm. the championship, having to sit and what, sit on your hands waiting for, for someone to get injured, because that's really what it is, isn't it? It, it, it is, but... I and, and, and Stevie mentioned Jurgen Klopp has been a huge factor, and, and I couldn't be in more agreement with the way Jurgen Klopp has has, has gotten signings right uh, in, in the way that he's man managed players coming in, um, even from from other leagues and, and, and different circumstances and pressures like Luis Diaz most most recently, and and I think that is the that is the big difference between this Liverpool and the ability of those young players, Darwin Nunes included, 
to settle in because yes, it's an unknown. We're a player coming from a, from another league, different pressures, different pace. How he's how he's going to settle in. Um, but I also feel that the manager plays a huge part in that. And Jurgen Klopp just continues to get these signings so absolutely right. Whether they come straight in, whether they have to buy their time a little bit like Diego Jota had to. But somehow it always it, 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 it works out. That being said, everything can be absolutely right for Darwin Nunes in terms of the transition, in terms of how Jurgen Klopp introduces him and puts his arm around and whatever else is needed. And it may still go wrong. But as of right now, everything is, an, is in as good a place as it could be to ensure success. <clears throat> the thing with Klopp is, and I'm going to repeat the point that Luis made, when you're on the periphery of anything and you're trying to get into it, and you know that even if somebody gets injured and you play, you know that yeah. as soon as the other guy's fit, he's back in, that's disheartening. Yeah. That, that makes it hard for players. But Luis's point to... To, about Klopp was is that when somebody comes in and plays well they stay in right so when you know you're just waiting on your chance A it, make, it, it, it gets your mind into a position where you say right I need to make sure I train harder even harder I need to make sure I'm prepared to get my chance whenever it comes because if I'm not ready when it comes then that might be the end of it so that keeps everybody on their toes it's fantastic. So Liverpool very much investing with youth. Meanwhile, for Manchester United, we've seen them over the past few years go the opposite direction and with the likes of Zlatan Ibrahimovic, Alexis Sanchez and, of course, Cristiano Ronaldo. The latest of one of the veteran players who's been linked to a move to Old Trafford is Robert Lewandowski. Of course, we thought he was going to Barcelona. Obviously, financially, Barca may not be in the situation to get him away from Bayern. Could this actually happen, Gab? Well, I, some of us have said this all along, right? Uh, we didn't quite understand what, what Lewandowski's agent, Pini Zahavi, was doing because, you know, last week you had Lewandowski going to the point of saying that something inside me has died, you know, referring to his time at Bayern and wanting to go, and it seems like all the eggs are in the Barcelona ba uh, basket. But as we know, and as, as Javier Tebas himself said uh, very, very recently, in fact, just last week, he said, like, guys, you can't sign anybody. You can't even sign Kessie and Christensen right now who are free agents. Uh, you need to sell first. So um, it was always looking to be very, very difficult. It was looking kind of odd that um, Lewandowski would be so exposed. We always wondered whether, you know, Zahavi certainly would have a plan B. Might that plan be Manchester United? And I think... You know, on the on the flip side, obviously no Champions League football, uh, which isn't great. But on the other hand, um, they need a center forward now. Whether this is Zahavi kind of you know going to United and saying, "Hey, you really like Lewandowski, don't you?" <laughs> um, or whether this is Eric Ten Hag saying, "Yeah, I need Lewandowski." For me personally, if you are thinking longer term rebuild. Giving a multi-year deal to, to, to Lewandowski would make very, very little sense to me. He'll obviously make you better in the short term, but longer term, probably not. Um, so I, I, it still feels like Lewandowski, to me, is stuck between a rock and a hard place, or indeed between Barcelona and Bayern. Luis, could you have a Lewandowski and Ronaldo front line? Does that work? <laughs> uh, I don't know. If you're asking me as a coach, I will say... Not for me. It wouldn't work, uh, at least the way that I've seen football. If we are talking about the UK manners to put it in different sides and maybe you are looking for bringing experience into the field, maybe yes. I have to say that uh, Ten Hag has proved that he enjoys having uh, a centre forward tall, strong, who can receive a uh, ball from, outside, uh, from uh, the wide areas like uh, Haller during the, the past couple of years. But I think that this is a move from United to try to, to take one of the players from Barcelona. I think he's been linked, uh, Frankie de Jong, he's been the player who most United has been wanting in the past uh, couple of weeks. And I think this is a way of putting pressure to Barcelona. Listen, you want to have Lewandowski for next year, he's a player who you want to have up front because you need a centre forward who score goals. Fine, but you need money. How are you going to get money if you sell me Frank de de Jong? So I think it could be a fantastic move from Manchester United. Yeah, trying to bring uh, uh, Lewandowski the, the, the chance of maybe moving to, uh, to Manchester United. But in the other side, I think what they're trying to do is sign Frankie de Jong and put Barcelona under, under pressure. Uh, away from the politics about what might be happening, Shank. Lewandowski to Manchester United. Is this something you would push forward if you were United? 
Um, I'm a little bit torn in that uh, it, it makes sense for United in that United's dressing room is just decidedly void of, of real world-class talent. And Lewandowski is, is exactly that. It doesn't make sense as that dressing room is made up right now to have Ronaldo and Lewandowski on the same pitch. So unless there's some plans in place to sign eight Angolo Cantes between now and the, and the end of August, right. who, who, who covers the ground... Um, to, to make up for those two, I, I'm not sure how how it works for, from from a coach's perspective, as 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 Lewis was saying. So I'm, I'm I, I, it, it depends on what Manchester United have planned. <laughs> I, I just don't see it though. What kind of coach can't coach a side with Lewandowski and Ronaldo up front? You telling me you can't organise what's going on behind them? To, to get them supply. Well, it depends Listen, on who you the, have behind the the, Well, yeah, it does. I mean, uh. I mean, <laughs> listen, what, what United really need to do is start again, right? And, and, and what everybody said, and from, from Gab to Louise and Shaq, it, it's, it's hard to argue because that's the right thing they need to do. They need to forget about signing guys who are 34, 35 and, and get some sort of plan in place over the next three or four years and build the club up. But really, you're telling me a coach can't organise a team to play with Ronaldo and Lewandowski up front? Seriously? How would you make it work with this United squad? Well, you'd have to... You'd have to clearly, clearly, you're not going to be paying, playing a, a type of football that, like a Liverpool, for example, that's a million miles an hour and you're hitting balls in behind. OK. But you have to find a way. There's, <laughs> right. a lot, there's lots of different ways to, to, to do so, it. So who do you have? Like, I'll tell you what, like, can you imagine Spain? Yeah, I'll give you a great example, right? Yeah. <laughs> can you imagine Spain if they had Lewandowski and Ronaldo up front? Right. How many goals would they score? OK. So well, just, just give me the personnel, though, that United have that can make this work. Well, clearly the personnel they have <laughs> is going to have to change somewhat. But, but, my but, point, but, but hold on a second. No, no, no you're not. See, you're being clever again. I'm not, I'm not my being point clever. Is, I'm just saying. Who, my point is, are you telling me <laughs> that a coach can't figure out a way to supply but you, I'm, without I'm, door I'm and just, I'm just saying, you are the coach of United. How do you make this work? Well, you need to get Dion for the stuff. <laughs> Frankie, get those two of the ball. Oh, oh, come on. You know, you've got one guy who's just got in the Premier League team of the year. The right. other guy who right. has been bandied around as the best number nine on, on the planet. Right. But yet, they shouldn't play together. Right. Come on. Come on. Right, there we come go. Uh, for, uh, Gab, did you want to say something before we go quickly? No, no, I, I, I am with you, Dan. Especially also, you just signed a coach in Eric Ten Hag who isn't one of those super pragmatic, oh, let me just suss this out and play with whoever I want. You signed him to play a certain way, which is much closer to the football that, that Liverpool play or Manchester City play um, than, than a different kind of football. So Allegedly. In that sense, it would make no sense at all. The other point I would make is, remember, Cristiano has a year left on his contract. Um, and I think that is also going to impact how you set up. Uh, and finally, regarding the Spain analogy, Stevie, the difference is Spain can't go and sign players from other countries. So they kind of have to win now oh, to get is. the best players on the pitch regardless. Just, you've, just the, uh, you've just joined the Dan Thomas School of Smarty <laughs> 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 oh. uh, yep. Summer camp is available. <laughs> uh, just a reminder, it's going to be a busy summer, isn't it? Uh, for all the latest, be sure to check out the latest edition of the Gab and Jules podcast. And the latest one will drop on Monday. Sources are reporting that Ten Hag has sent an email to his new Manchester United squad saying... There'll be no room for egomaniacs within his team. Sentiment is good. But yeah. when you think of egos in football, inevitably you go to maybe their top goal scorer from last season. And if you're Cristiano Ronaldo, do you want to be receiving these? Do these emails make any difference to your squad, to the players? Is it all... Well, I don't Nonsense. quite... Uh, hmm? Garbage. Absolute garbage. What's the point? Well, there isn't, there's no point. It does nothing. Like if, and why you would do it? 
The fact if he has done this would worry me if I'm a Man United fan as well. Because if you look at all the best managers, the important things are done in front of people's faces. They're done eye to eye, whether it's a single player or whether it's a squad, whether it's his staff, whatever it may be. The only way, and we're talking about a culture that, that needs to be built. You don't build a culture by sending emails out and telling them what it's going to be. Right. You build a culture by, from the very first day, setting standards, whatever it may be. And then when somebody doesn't meet that standard, bang, you hit them as hard as you can. That's what Fergie did. That's what all the best managers do. They don't do it in an email. You, he shouldn't be doing anything other than talking to somebody face to face. First day of training, you get them in, you get them in front of you, and you, you lay down the law. This is how we do it, or this is how we're doing it now. And if you don't like it, then that's fine. You can, if you want to get yourself out the door, then that's fine. Right. But if you don't toe the line, then you'll be going out the door another way. So that's when you start. Not in an email. That, to me, that's just wrong. Let's just pretend, Shaka, that I'm an egomaniac and I receive that email. I don't suddenly think, oh, I better not be an egomaniac <laughs> today. <laughs> well, to Stevie's point uh, that he was rather aggressively making, the, uh, for a minute there, I thought he was going to come for you, Dan. You don't, <laughs> you don't, you don't send an email, you do it to people's faces. I was, well, you, I was a little bit scared there. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> but you do. You have, to, you have to set a tone. Right. I mean... Because he cited the if fact you, he wants it to be like Sir Alex Ferguson era, doesn't he? He right. wants to bring back that sort of authority. <laughs> right, well, if that's what he wants, he should have thought, right, what would Alec do? So he's got what he's... Well, he didn't have emails in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Smarty pants his back, yeah. Smarty pants his back. But the mere fact he thinks that's okay, is, in, in my opinion, is, is, a, is a, a black mark against him. Because... Right. You don't do that. You set a standard, to, and you only do it by, by looking at people in the eye and telling them. To, to that point, Sir Alex Ferguson earned that authority in, in that dressing room through who he was as a person, how he carried himself, and, and how he communicated, particularly in, in, in person. So I, while I, I understand the need for Ten Hag to feel that he needs to be more like Sir Alex Ferguson, that that maybe has been missing and why Manchester United have been starved of the success that, that they have, that's something that you only earn on the training ground or in the dressing room. That's not something that you kind of spell out in pre-season or, or before pre-season even starts, by, by email or any other form of communication. And here's the other thing is well done. You, you're sending, you're sending if, if you get texts and emails and all kinds of stuff, if the three of us could read the same thing and take something different from it. Right. Mm. So that's, that's getting off on the wrong foot straight away. So it, it makes no sense. Sir Alex Ferguson, of course, cited it as the role that he wants to follow. But when you played with him, what, in 1986 at the World Cup? Yep. It wasn't quite as strict as you thought it was going to be. Well, he did have a little thing called Manchester United on his mind. Right. That was with the Scotland team. Yeah. He, he actually got the job while he was with us in the World Cup, so I'm, I'm, I can't, after finding out what was going on, yes. it kind of made sense, right? because let's, with all due respect, going from Aberdeen to Manchester United is a rather huge leap, um, and so of course he was occupied with that, so I'm sure that was part of the reason why he was so relaxed. Oh, there you are. Not because he trusted you players. Sure, he trusted you guys. He trusted well. Stevie. He trusted Stevie. He trusted yeah, he did. Stevie. He did trust. Well, I had, and there was a lot of Aberdeen players there as well. So, right. Um, yeah. I mean, I, we're talking about two completely different scenarios. How because the one thing I will tell you, yeah, as relaxed as he was at, 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 in Mexico with yes. the international team, yes, he was the complete and utter opposite. This is, this is a guy who knew where everybody was before they were getting there. Yes. This guy could tell you where... He had scouts. He little, had yeah. people everywhere in Manchester, London, you name it. He knew what they were all up to. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different scenario, scenario. How do you deal with this dressing room, Stevie? Like if you're Ten Hag day one, do you go in as authorities of your saying? You, get you look rid people in the eye you get rid and you of say, I ones. don't care if you're Cristiano Ronaldo, I don't care if you're... You figure out who's causing the problems. How do you find that out? Just by the way people act, the things that are being said. You know, I've, most players, and I'm, and I'm going to assume most players, forget 
that there are staff in and around the dressing room, in the treatment room, in the halls that have got ears. And most players forget that. Mm. And so they'll be having conversations and things are being said. And if you're a smart head coach, that's all coming back to you. Okay. Not just the guys in the clubs at 2 o'clock in the morning. Everything that happens inside that building, you should know what's going on. And if you don't, then you're not doing your job properly. Or you haven't got your staff doing the job properly. So then once you figure out who the troublemakers are, then you, you've got a decision. Do you, do, do you go the Fergie way? which is, I don't give a stuff who you are, what your name is, how much you get, how many goals you scored, you're at the door, because that's what he did. Or, if you go the other way, the, the, you're just never going to get rid of the problem. You've got to weed out the rats, basically. To, to just, to, to, just, sorry, just to the Mbappe situation at PSG, if you're Ten Hag, do you have a conversation with any of the senior players? Like if, if you're, do you speak to David De Gea or somewhere like that and say, what's going on? With the Mbappe situation at PSG. So, obviously, Mbappe, the suggestion is he has the power, right. yes, to go to someone right. and say, get rid of him, keep him. Do you utilise some of the senior players to try and get an insight into what's going on in the dressing room? No. Or is that dangerous? No, that, that's dangerous. You, you have to establish that authority yourself. You have to have that conversation yourself with, with the player in question. Right. Uh, it, it, Going through going through somebody else, I, I think weakens you immeasurably. To, to, to the point that that Stevie is making, knowing what's going on through coaches in the dressing room or whatever is only a part of the job. You then have to confront when anything is happening that needs needs to be addressed. You then need to confront that person one on one, face to face, and and have that conversation with them, as, as, Stevie, as, as Stevie put it, regardless of how many goals you've scored, how many, what role you've played, how many starts you had last, what, whatever it may be, wherever you play on the park, have that discussion and if they don't fit into to your plans, if they don't respect your authority or it, it, it proves that they're going to be a problem, then you have to get rid of them. That is the only way the rest of the dressing room Follows your, follows your lead and believes in you because the slightest, the slightest sign of weakness, right. every single other player in that dressing room will take advantage. I also think it's important that you have a good captain. And yeah, you need a good... But who's that going to be, Stevie? Well, I, 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 who's that going to be at yeah. United? He's going to have to figure it out. Yeah, not, and I'm, I'm not talking just for the dressing room or, or on the field, but as part of as an extension of you as the coach as well, because if you get that relationship with your captain, you can, again, it's another way of finding out what's the mood of the players, you know? Do they need a day off? Or, mm. you know, anything you can do to, in, to involve the players through the captain right. makes them feel as though they're actually involved in right. it. Whether it's silly things like, would we rather get the bus at seven in the morning or nine in the morning? Or just, but it makes them feel as though they are actually involved. But, but I think Maguire's the captain at the moment. He's not even guaranteed a start. Well, and that's again, it's huge. You you need a cap, you need a real captain, a guy that doesn't have to be the best player on the team, right? But has a, a level of consistency that means he keeps his place. But he has to have the respect of the other players. If your captain doesn't have that, you have no chance. Could be a goalkeeper though. If you're at United. So, why, why you make that face? <laughs> why you make that face? <laughs> Just we, to remind we, you. We are, the most, we are the most responsible players in the dressing room I've found in my many years. Uh, just to remind that extra time, as always, available over on our YouTube channel. We stay late to answer your tweets. Be sure to check it out. Uh, it finishes there in uh, Spain 2, uh, Czech Republic and nil. Oh, former Spanish international, Luis Garcia is here to reflect on Spain and that 2-0 victory. Um, a, a win is a win, obviously, Luis, but we were talking while watching this game about how impressive, once again, Gabby is for someone who is 17 years of age, but to have that level of confidence to do it on the international stage is a bit special. Yes, Dan, it's scary. Just to watch him play, that, uh, that personality he brings on the field is just uh, outstanding. Uh, first time we watched him, he was uh, 16. He was in a precision game uh, last year. And uh, I was surprised because he was raising the hands to Frankie de Jong because he didn't understand the pass. And I said, 
He's, he's quite a bold guy. He's fearless. He, he's not afraid to talk with the, with the more experienced players. And, well, after a year, I can say that he's one of the most exciting players, Spanish international players that, that we, have, uh, we have watched in the past few years. Today, once again, he played 30 minutes because he, uh, Luis Enrique gave him the rest. He played the first two. And once again, every single time that he was on the ball, he's got everything so clear. The awareness, the time space that he's got is just fantastic. Two feet, he can go from one side to the other side. He's got one by one. And now he's getting that something extra at front because he used to be a, a player because he was young, of course, who had, had grabbed the ball, passed the ball, tried to play easy every single time. No losing the ball. He's got that fight every single ball. He puts the body, he's strong. But now he's bringing something extra. He's scoring goals. He's giving that last pass. He's playing more. Uh, he's, he's playing closer to the box, and that's something that for Luis Enrique is key. And this has become one of those special players for that for the World Cup we are going to need so much because, as you've seen today, once again we struggle so much with scoring goals. We create something, but mm. it's kind of we don't have that kind of finisher. We don't have that Lewandowski we've been talking about. We don't have any more those Fernando Torres or David Villa who could finish every single game. Now we have the ball, we create chances, but we don't capitalize them. And that's something that worries me a lot for the World Cup. Who do you have up top, Luis, if you're in charge? Who, which one I would put up front? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite difficult because at the moment we don't have that kind of players anymore. And we got a lot of players who can run around. We've seen today once again Luis Enrique using Asensio as a center forward and actually uh, it worked a little bit Danny Olmo can play also in that uh, in that role but they are not center forward they are not finisher they are not players who uh, are gonna be ready to receive the ball turn and score some players that uh, there is no anymore here in Spain that's why Luis Enrique has been calling Raul de Tomas from Espanol because he's a similar player, but still not a number nine. He likes to play a little bit on the Y, make those kind of diagonals. So at the moment, we have to change. And that's not something that Luis Enrique doesn't know how to deal with. Because when he was playing, uh, when he was managing Barcelona, we, they didn't have a, a center forward. It was kind of a change in position, trying to have in a player who can drop, receive the ball, and arrive from second line. Players like Gabi, Pedri, or today uh, Soler can arrive from second line and scoring goal. That's something that we've seen from Pep Guardiola, Luis Enrique after that. And it's something that it, can, it could be used. But definitely, we don't have any more that center forward who can score 25 goals in, in, a, in a season. We have to wait and see uh, how, uh, what, what player decides to, to bring on the field because Morata looks like it's going to be. But until uh, it's a lot of months, and I think that Luis Enrique is going to have to be very ready to see who is the one who to play in position. Is it too simple to say, Stevie, unless Spain find a number nine who isn't Alvaro Morata, they won't win the World Cup? No, I don't, I don't think it is because, you know, at times you just need a goal scorer to pull a goal from nowhere. Right. And they don't have that. And so to win the World Cup, you, you, need, you need somebody who scores regularly to win games. The chances are maybe somebody gets hot, but if you look at it in a realistic point of view, where are the goals coming from? As good as they are, where are the goals coming from? And nobody's got an answer. Nobody. Chaka, do you have the answer? <laughs> I, I, I don't, but I, 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 don't, I don't think it's too simple to say that at all. I think, but for a, an out-and-out striker uh, that Luis is describing, Spain probably should have beat Italy and, and could have gone on to win the Euros. Yeah. Um, and now with the World Cup, I, I think there, there's a step up to that as well. So that is, is, is needed for speed. That's it. That brings us to the end of today's show. Be sure to stay tuned, though. Extra time is next. Luis Garcia back with us. Uh, Shaka and Stevie as well to answer your tweets. Stay tuned. Welcome into the latest edition of Extra Time. Thank you as always for your tweets. Shaka Hislop is here. Luis Garcia joins us as well. Uh, Luis, you would have missed this over the last couple of days as Stevie got Wesley Schneider mixed up with Wesley Snipes. Uh, this has then been an, I heard, I heard. <laughs> an ongoing thing. Easily done. An, an, easily an, done. An easy mistake. Well, uh, it's the name, isn't it? It's the name? Yeah. What do you mean? Well, that's how we 
Co have got it mixed up. Right, but why would you think that Wesley Snipes would be talking about being as good as Messi or Ronaldo if he didn't drink as much wine? Well, if I knew that, Dan, I wouldn't brought it on the first place. Well, yes, indeed. There are a lot of questions around your mistake. Wow. Uh, Stevie, do you think Wesley Snipes <laughs> should have won the 2010 Ballon d'Or? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with Inter after winning a treble. Personally, I would have given him an, an Oscar. Yes, yes, but, I think so. Uh, an Emmy. The Ballon d'Or, no. The, the whole shebang. Yeah. There you go. For his services to cinema. Right, yes. Okay. Hey, away from that, see, I haven't seen you since. Was it your 40 year wedding anniversary? It Last was, week? yes. Congratulations. Thank you, Shaka. Well, yeah. Congratulations yeah. to your good lady hey, wife, go. more to the point. Now, what, yes. what intrigued me was your destination for the dinner. What, the oyster bar? Yes, oysters and Steve Nichol are not something that I would put together. Dan, I don't know that you know this, but right. you get a fantastic well done Philip Mignon <laughs> at the That's oyster what bar. What are you going to the oyster bar for? Correct. Yes. Makes complete sense. That, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, like, I like how you start off with, I don't know if you knew this. <laughs> I go to the oyster bar, all the type of ice sticks. Did Eleanor have a steak as well? Or did she have something fishy? I can't kind of remember. That's good. I can't even remember. Uh, where do you stand on your steak, Louise? Well done as well. <laughs> uh, medium bread. Yes, like a normal person. <laughs> <laughs> the steak house is nice to As soon as you don't get this, just because somebody likes yeah, a well done steak. Yeah, but I will go steak, to the steakhouse. Right, yes. it's abnormal. <laughs> but you don't, you know, but you don't have to pay thirty-five dollars for a well done steak. I didn't. Matter. I paid forty-six. Blooming <laughs> extra. <steak>. Aye, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And you just burnt it. You could burn any slab like, of meat and it would taste But I same. like it. Oh, that's good. Look at, which, Stevie, there's what no What makes way. you so much better than me? Because you don't like Stevie, a well done steak. You, there's absolutely no way you like anything that you have to pay $46 for. <laughs> no, I did. That was a gift card, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 oh goodness. Uh, Luis, we've heard that playing away at Getafe is like going to the dentist. Has this been your experience? <laughs> going away to Getafe? Yes. Uh, no, I mean, it's a very... A humble team and uh, to be honest playing uh, at that stadium is very quiet I mean normally you will get 8,000 people 10,000 people so if you go there actually it's quite easy when we used to go with Atletico in Madrid it wasn't one of those uh, stadiums that you were afraid to to play again so yeah I, I, I don't get that but well, yeah I, it could be I could be for us it was a, a quite nice to go there because uh, we always had the chance of, of winning it and Luis, was it, is it the Alfonso Perez Coliseum? Never has the word Coliseum yes. been such a letdown <laughs> when you look at it. I know, I know. And, and Alfonso, that is one of the big uh, names on the international uh, Spanish team back on the 90s and early 2000s. But, uh, and it's actually very nice stadium. I have to say uh, that my son follows uh, Getafe. He's a big fan of uh, Getafe. So I've been there in the past few months quite a few times. But still, when you go to play there, it's it's okay. It's okay. You're, why? you're afraid to go. Why the? Why would you follow Hetafe? I, 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 it's something that we don't explain. I mean, he was when he was a kid. Uh, follow uh, Atletico in Madrid. Yeah. And I, we went to uh, to one of the games. Uh, it was Real Madrid, Atletico in Madrid, Al de Calderon. He was one. I think what a final Champions League. They lost the game, and he was crying, saying, "Why, Daddy? Why?" And uh, since then, he became a Getafe fan. I don't wow. know why. Probably it was because of that. But uh, now he's as a big supporter of Getafe. He's got every single uh, jersey and wow. and almost every weekend. So yeah. Well, the good thing is he'll, he'll, he'll never see them lose a Champions League game. So I suppose uh, you know, not, going not forward. Not again. I think that was that. He's avoided it. Stevie, when did you realise that football management was your calling? Oh. Post retirement or as a professional player? I didn't. I just kind of fell into it. To be honest with you. I mean, I didn't. As we all do when we get to the end of our, our playing days, you start thinking about what you're going to do next because you kind of keep playing forever. Right. And so I figured that the only thing I could maybe do was coach. Um, and then from there, I just kind of fell into it. I went to, went to Notts County as an assistant to Howard Kendall to learn the ropes. Um, that lasted six months um, and then I came over here to play and coach so I kind of fell into it. Do you miss it? No. 
Really? No. I thought, you'd, I thought you'd miss some of it, like the camaraderie of it all, like the banter that. with everyone. You miss, like, yes, there's things you miss about it, but 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 no, there's no. nothing worse than a Saturday night after losing. Right. It's just awful. Yeah. It's horrible, and the rest of the weekends are horrible until you get going again. Whether it's a Monday to Tuesday, and then you kind of get back in the swing of it. But no, listen. The day I stopped coaching, I stopped taking blood pressure pills. Huh? There you go. And then you work with I us. I was on blood pressure pills. Never in my life. Right. And the day I stopped, yeah. the following week, I stopped taking it. I didn't need them. And now look at you. And now look at me. Yeah. Fit as a fiddle. A picture of health. <laughs> yeah. a picture of Steve. Uh, Louis, health. you're doing your badges. Liverpool or Barcelona? Who do you want to coach first? First, I like it. I love how it sounds. Uh, I will go first to Barcelona. It's closer, family. I got my friends there, and then I will jump to Liverpool, like, like I did when I was playing. So yeah, I would love to do that. Oh, imagine how much oh, we yeah. criticise you on the show, Luis, oh. your manager. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to start. A few years yeah, because of that. Because all, you, you... All, what if you're the next Hitafe manager? He'd be coming home and he's still be giving a belt. Yeah. <laughs> what are hey, you, Daddy? Why? What are you doing playing Why are you Daddy all over again? <laughs> Daddy, you should. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Steve. <laughs> Can we keep going? <laughs> Shaka, would you rather travel through Scotland with Stevie or travel through Spain with Luis? Ooh. <laughs> I'd prefer to travel through Spain. Well, yes, I, I'm surprised that Luis, took you so yeah. long to think. I was, I was going to suggest. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just saying. Scotland is Scotland. Is a I was going to suggest you did Scotland that. Scotland is a beautiful country. Scotland is a beautiful country. <laughs> but I'll be eating steak while down all, all trip long. <laughs> Yeah, good choice. <laughs> Can you sail the trip through Scotland? No. No? No. Why? Why would I want to do that? Well, it'd be nice to see, <laughs> see you. I'd rather, I'd rather go to Spain and all. Can I come with you? <laughs> I'd like to see some. Luis, can I come with Shaka? Oh, you can join. Jo yeah. Yes, Steve, you can join us. Of yeah. course. Forget the bicycle diaries. I mean, let's be honest. When, when you and I were in Madrid, yes. I mean, I just, I just fitted in smoothly. <laughs> right? <laughs> we did have a good trip. Well, of course we did. I feel Liverpool is in need of a midfielder who can get double-figure goals and assists. Who do you feel can come into that side and improve it? And people seem to forget that there will be five subs next season, which plays well into City hands. Do you agree with that, Luis? What part? The, 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 about the five subs? Five subs. <laughs> it's a long question. <laughs> uh, let's start off with a midfielder who can get double figures, yeah. both goal and assist. Is that who Liverpool need? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure if they need something like that, but I agree that the, uh, a midfielder who can add you uh, double figure is not easy, I have to tell you that. And much more because uh, we've seen that when Liverpool plays and uh, most of the teams get back and get stuck, bring a lot of numbers in front of the box and it's very difficult to break them. I think that a creative uh, midfielder who can give something different, uh, it could be fantastic as well. We've seen how Thiago uh, ended up the, the season and how he can do that. Uh, but you need another player, not only him. you got players like Fabinho, like Henderson, uh, that can fight for it. Milner can, can give you the strength, the run, fight. But sometimes you need a player who can uh, put that ball between the lines, that uh, pass without looking like uh, Thiago does, like uh, Firmino when he's on the field does. These kind of different players who can bring something from nowhere. And that's something that the Liverpool have struggled this season. We've been talking about this Liverpool side for quite a while and we all agree that, that they are missing more goals up front and they are missing that creative part because they always face against teams. They are a big block at the back and it's very difficult to break those lines. So I think that another one would be fantastic for the a long, long season that is going to be the next one. Luis, as a player, given all the trousers that you made, what was the most interesting, bizarre way that a club tried to recruit you? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, Never something strange or, or bizarre. I think that um, at least back then, remember there was no social media. We, if we can see on these days how they uh, they are a bit more creative, how they present the players. Actually, when 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 I arrived to uh, to Liverpool, there was no presentation with with public that, that we can see on these days. The players come out on the field and there is a few people just clapping and, and bringing on you. We were only Xavi Alonso, Rafa Benitez and myself taking pictures 
quite actually it's strange, but uh, it's the way that it was done back then. So there's been never something uh, bizarre about it. It was only, yeah, come here, you want to come. And I always be, it was open to, to, to face another challenge. Finally, for Luis, who are your favourites to win La Liga next season, given that Real Madrid haven't been the best at retaining domestic titles in recent years? Uh, the last time they did it was 2008. Jan, after, and he's going to hurt me a lot, but after what I've seen Real Madrid last season uh, winning the, 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 the two trophies, the two big trophies, La Liga and Champions League, and the way that they are uh, adding more players to their, their squad, I could see Real Madrid just winning it once again. I, I understand that Barcelona is going to be fighting again, that Atletico Madrid is going to need to make an extra effort to be challenged for La Liga once again after a very unstable uh, season. Uh, but I think Real Madrid now with Rudiger, with Tonamani uh, arriving and maybe another signing, it could be a very difficult Real Madrid to beat. So I, I could see Real Madrid winning once again La Liga. Perfect. Good stuff. That is it. That brings us to the end of today's Extra Time. Thank you, as always, for your tweets. EFC, ESPN FC. Only been doing it for, what, 10 years? Can't say it. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow for more. Steve, are you with us? I am, Dan. Oh, what a treat. More, we more Wesley Schneider, Wesley Schneider. Well, we <laughs> well done, Steak. The old, the old classics all coming out. <laughs> Ah. 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 Ah.